so as I told you before we started and I hinted at here, so I came from the progressive world. I've been, I now view being progressive basically as a mental disorder or something. <laughs> and, and, but I consider myself classic liberal, which really, really is conservative in a lot of respects. It's, yeah, it's, it's libertarian essentially. Yeah, it's technically defined as conservative or libertarian. So I'm somewhere in there. Um, and it seems to me that, that the Republicans, if they would stick with what are supposed to be their principles that you're talking about, they would have a much better argument than what they have right now, and that they don't stick to their argument, and right. that's part of the problem. Well, I think that what's happened is as government has gotten larger, it turns into this giant grab bag of cash, and so what you have is a bunch of constituencies in the United States who are dependent on these grab bags of cash. I, mean, I remember I was, I was down in Palm Beach, Florida for, uh, for a conference, this must have been five years ago, and, uh, and Linda Lingle, who was then running for Senate in Hawaii, uh, was former governor of Hawaii, Republican, she was, she was speaking at a, at a synagogue. And I was there, and this little old lady, Palm Beach, a very rich area, this little yeah. old lady toddles up to her, pearl necklace, diamond earrings, and she walks up to her and she says, what will you do to keep them from cutting my social security? And I thought to myself, who are you? Like, you paid $50 into Social Security when you were 35, and you're probably getting out $3,000 a month now. But because people have been made that promise, they're now dependent on the government. So what do Republicans do? Republicans say, no, 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 no. I would never do away with Social Security, right? We would transition it, or we would save it. Once you get into the business of the government takes care of you in your old age, now we're just arguing over methodology. We're not arguing over morality. My view is that people have been made promises. We have to keep those promises because otherwise we just have too many people who have no source of income. You make a promise, you keep a promise. But yeah. if you are under a particular age, no social security at all. Take, I want my money back, okay? I'm getting 15% of my salary taken every year right. to be put in a fund that I will never see again. Again, I have, I have one child and I have another one on the way. I would much prefer to put that in a SEP IRA and just let that grow with the stock market. By the way, you want the stock market to boom. Take all the money out of Social Security and put it into companies on the stock market. You want to see an actual economic growth curve. That would do it, as opposed to pretending that it's in a lockbox somewhere that doesn't exist when they're just raiding it every two days for... for the lockbox never existed. Never that, existed. It, there were, Gore said he had the lockbox. There was no box. There was no lockbox. It's, yeah. it's a Ponzi scheme. All right, so to the left, though, because I, I'm, with yeah. you, I'm with you on that, that they're, not, they're sort of just not holding to their principles. So what I've seen in the left is that most people went from being liberal, and then somehow over the last couple of years, they've become these social justice warriors, and they've divided everybody by what all our differences are of skin color and religion and all that, and they've picked a pecking order of who's the most aggrieved. And that right, the victim hierarchy. Yeah. The victim hierarchy, and because of this, uh, it seems to me that it's just a, there's no end to it. That, that's what scares me the most about the ideology is there simply is no end game with it because ultimately it has to eat itself because then one day you'll fight for everybody else and then they'll come around and, and they'll come for you. I mean, this is what's happening on college campuses, right? College yeah. campuses are about as left as it's possible to be except that the leftists are now eating their own, right? They're going to the administrators and saying, you're all microaggressing us and we need trigger warnings and it's white privilege. And they're ousting people who, who were protesting in these buildings 40 years ago right. on the left and they're, they're getting them fired now. I mean, Lar Lawrence Summers was, was Clinton's secretary of the treasury. I was at Harvard when they threw him out, right? And they threw him out because he, he made the politically incorrect statement that maybe there weren't that many women in the high reaches of science because women didn't want to be in the high reaches of science, or it's possible there weren't enough women who were qualified for that, and they threw them out for that. I mean, the, the, what's happened, I think, is that we've reached a point, we're the wealthiest society in the history of the world. The people here are the wealthiest that, that any people have ever been. And we've also, forgotten that there's a that there's any sort of ideological existential threat. This, I was four when the Soviet Union collapsed. So people my age and younger don't remember the Soviet Union. They don't they don't recall it. It's not important to their lives. And when they think of socialism, they think of kind of the happy dappy socialism of Denmark. They never look at the tax rates, mm -hmm. but they think okay, everything's going okay in Denmark. They forget forget the fact that we've paid for Denmark's national security for the last half century. Forget the fact that they're now having to cut their taxes. Forget the fact they just elected a conservative government to keep out the Islamic wave that's now swamping them. All those things go by the wayside. So what happens is that all these people kind of live off the fat of the land, we all do, mm -hmm. and then rip away at the foundations. Because when you're living in such a, a rich society, and you look at, for example, income inequality, and you say there are some people who are earning millions of dollars, and there are some people who are earning tens of thousands of dollars. What we forget is that in human history and in human society, the difference there, there's the difference millions of dollars and tens, and tens of thousands of dollars. And then there's where people have been historically, which is here. Right, and when you rip away the foundations, everybody's gonna end up down here. You can't just take all of the founding principles of small government and free markets and rip them away. But what's happened is 
when young people are always looking for a reason to fight. I mean, we, we want to change the world. That's our thing, changing right. the world. Right, right. Well, when the world's pretty good, what do you change? We've, we've basically changed a, a lot of the external circumstances. And now the question is, you're rich, you live a pretty free life, right? So what's wrong? Only what I feel is wrong. What's in here is what's wrong. And so it's become a very feelings-based society. Anything that's said to me that hurts my feelings is now no longer just something hurtful. It's a microaggression, right? Yeah. And, and I can actually reach out and I can harm you. I can, I can ban you. I can call the police if you hurt my feelings. At University of Missouri, there was actually, when, when this whole thing was going down, there was there, the, the University of Missouri Police Department put out a notice. If somebody says something to you that's racist, call the police department. Yeah. Right, 70 per, there's a poll that, that just came out that 70% of college students are comfortable with, with hate speech codes on campus. 40% of college student, of millennials, people aged 18 to 34, 40% of them believe that speech that's offensive to, to women or minorities should be banned so is in the United this, States across the board. Right, so is some of this though that young people are just kind of dumb? Like the world is gonna teach you some stuff and when you're at college, you're gonna be kind of dumb. I, I had a guest on a couple of weeks ago, Michael Shermer, who said mm -hmm. that their, all this microaggression stuff and all of this free speech stuff, as horrible as it sounds to us, right? Mm -hmm. He sort of was arguing that in a way, you could say this shows the progress because instead of having to fight for actual things, they're fighting for these feelings and not that he was for that, no, I, but I it shows you that we've progressed and that, you know, that black people aren't fighting so that they have separate water fountains, they're now fighting over things that may that are just about well, feelings, and that's obviously a lot no, better. No, so that, it's, it's a progress. testament, and you're right, it's a testament to the progress, but I mean, to, to go off what you were saying, 50 years ago, black people were fighting to not have separate water fountains, and today and they're fighting they're, to have separate water fountains, right? I mean, they actually want separate black housing at USC. They actually wanted a separate black safe space at University of Missouri. This is dangerous stuff, and, and what's more dangerous is an entire political hierarchy that benefits from this. Because now you've got candidates who benefit by telling particular interest groups and racial groups, you're a victim, we're gonna help you out. The way we're gonna help you out is by specifically calling the rest of the society racist. You're a victim forever. And the longer we can make you feel like you're a victim, the, the more you're dependent on us, right? Well, we'll just go, I mean, Hillary Clinton was doing this in, in Harlem the other day. She's saying, yeah, we, we haven't cured racism in the country, and that's why I'm gonna take hundreds of millions of dollars and pour it into Harlem, as though nobody's poured hundreds of millions of dollars into Harlem before. Right. The only dollars into Harlem that are actually gonna matter are police dollars to clean up high crime areas so that investors will go in. The reason that businesses aren't going into high crime areas is because they're high crime areas, and just dumping money in there ain't gonna help anything. So, so you would agree that racism exists of course, at some level, in, right? It, that there, there are, are people that are legitimate racists. It would be idiotic to, to think otherwise. Of course, there are legitimate racists and we should target them and we should find them and we should hurt their careers because racism is unacceptable. But what I don't agree with is this, I don't like fighting phantoms, as I said earlier. Yeah. Institutional racism is, is a meaningless phrase. Libraries are not racist. Schools are not racist. You have to show me a law, a policy, a person who's racist. You can't just say American society is racist because that doesn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. Show me the actual problem that we can discuss because when you just throw tautologies out there like that, what am I supposed to do? I mean, there's no way to fight that. There's legitimately no way to fight that. Right, so I discussed that with Larry Elder, who's conservative, but yeah, uh, on, the, on the libertarian side, and he basically said what you just said. And I mm -hmm. think some of my progressive friends would say, well, it may not be institutional anymore in that there are uh, laws that existed no mm -hmm. longer exist, but they would say, well, uh, certain communities will get less, because of racism, just because of the idea of racism, will get less qualified people to teach and that they will be treated differently by the police and all of those. Well, by, by income level, that's true, but it's true by income level. It's not, race and income level tend to correlate, unfortunately, but, that's, right. but that's, that's more to do with income level than it has to do with race. It's not like there's somebody sitting in Sacramento today in California going, oh, black community, we're not putting anybody in there. I mean, the real, the real gap in the country, especially between rich and poor, is two-parent households, not race. I mean, the, the poverty rate in the black community for two-parent households is 7%. The poverty rate in the white community for, for single-parent households is 22%. So Larry said that to me mm -hmm. also, that same thing, and he got a lot of hate for it, and then I got lumped into the hate. Yeah. Because people, so I'll just go with you on sure. that for, for the purpose. Well, I mean, a statistic is Yeah, yeah, statistic, so, right? so I'll, I'll trust <laughs> that you're giving me a, a fair statistic. Yeah, that's right? a real statistic. So, okay, so, so fair enough. But that, that enrages people. There's, there's something about that concept, I think, that really upsets people. And you would say that that's really because of the feeling thing? Well, the, of? yeah, this is, as my, my catchphrase goes, facts don't care about your feelings. I mean, the, the reality and is- And tweet. Yeah, exactly. The, yeah. This is, as, as we move forward in American society, the only thing that's going to cure the ills that we have is looking at some of the real problems straight in the face. I mean, the fact is that when welfare was instituted in the 60s, before it was instituted, the black single motherhood rate was 20%. It is now in excess of 70%. And it's not just 
it's not just impacting the black community, it's impacting the white community. Right? The white community used to have a 5% single motherhood rate, now it's in excess of 40%. Okay, the fact is you're going to get higher crime, you're going to get more poverty. It's the, the Brookings Institute, which is a left institute, right? I mean, it's a, it's a liberal institute, the Brookings mm -hmm. Institute, and they, they kind of straddle that line between liberal and left. They say that if you don't want to be permanently poor in the United States, you need to do three things and three things only. Graduate high school, get a job and hold it, don't have a baby before you're married. That's it. And by the way, those things have nothing to do with racism, right? There's not a white person, there, let's, there are very few, I, I would be hard pressed to find a black person in America. You almost straw manned yourself there. Well, right, I, I'd be hard pressed to, maybe there is one, because maybe there's one. Yeah. But they, 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 I don't know how many single, black single mothers got pregnant because a white man was holding a gun to a black man's head and said, I want you to impregnate this person, then leave. Okay, the single motherhood is a decision that's made by the people who are involved in the sexual act and what happens afterward. And it's the single best predictor of, of gener intergenerational poverty. So make good decisions. So, so is really the issue that when the left doesn't deal with these things honestly, that then they're just handing it to the right? I mean, I see this, uh, we've been talking about this a lot related to all this stuff with Islamism, that mm -hmm. because the left calls everyone a racist, so anytime me or any of my friends that are talking about this, there's not many of us on the left, mm -hmm. every time we bring it up, I mean, I'm getting called a bigot left and right now, right. and yet they can't, I say, well, can you point to something bigoted I've said or something racist I've said, they can't. But it's a feeling, you know, they it's feel a, offended. They, they feel offended, but is this where, if the left doesn't deal with something, so you know, you can mm -hmm. talk about Islamism, or if the, def, if the left doesn't deal with the roots of income inequality as you've laid out, that you just hand it to the far right, ultimately, right? I mean, doesn't this sort of explain Trump to you well, a little bit? I think, I, well, to, to a certain extent, I think that that's right. I think that what happens is that there is a, a and I would never justify people reacting in racist fashion because you know you can react in reasonable fashion to stupidity. Mm -hmm. People say silly things like single motherhood doesn't matter and I say no single motherhood absolutely does matter. But what what people tend to, what what some a certain segment of the population and this is true both on the left and the right is when they when when somebody says something they don't like they immediately go to racism. I mean I can't tell you the number of tweets I've received after after I said that I don't like Donald Trump. That's when the anti-semites come out of the woodwork and it's and <laughs> right. it's bizarre to me like it's it's like what is what does my Jewishness have to do with not liking Trump? As far as I'm aware, his daughter is an actual convert to Judaism. Right. So right. it's it's weird, but it's but um, yeah. No, I think that it's it's polarizing the, the debate in a way that, that need not. We're not we're not trying to solve problems anymore in American politics. All we're trying to do is demonize the other side and turn them into the bad guy. And so my goal is to demonize the people who try to demonize. Right. The, 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 those are the people who ought to be demonized. If if your goal in politics is to just make character attacks without regard to facts, then I'm not interested in, in debating you on, on facts, because you're clearly not interested in debating on facts. Yeah, so that's a, that's a good segue, because I read your 11 rules for okay. debating a yeah. leftist, and I just read, I read the entire thing this morning. Okay, that's yeah, pretty so short, it's, it's, yeah. It's pretty short, but it's on my mind, and basically everything you said, I was struggling when I was reading it, because I was like, ah, oh, I'm agreeing with all of this. Like, yeah. there's, because I still consider myself liberal, and there's a part of me that I don't want to read something by a guy that's conservative and mm -hmm. go, I agree with this stuff, but a lot of what I saw in there are the exact tactics that I've seen this regressive left use on me and use on you know Sam Harris and all these other people. Yeah, exactly, that's right. Re relentlessly. So you really gave the antidote to some of these things. So you don't have to lay out all 11, but do you want to pick some highlights? Because I think there's some really interesting Yeah, stuff. I mean, a, a lot of them kind of kind of turn into, okay, so I'm, I'm trying to remember all 11 off the top of my head, or at least we some can do, of them. Yeah, give, give me a couple of them. So, so the, the first one is that you have to embrace the fight. You have to understand going in that you're in a fight, usually, and you have to sort of determine the purpose of the conversation conversation that you're having. Mm -hmm. this is just based, and this is true if you're left or right, actually. Determine what your goal is. Is your goal to convince the person on the other side? Is the person open to being convinced? If not, you're wasting your time. Uh, is, are, are you on a show and, you, and there's an audience, in which case you're not speaking to the person, you're speaking to the audience? Uh, and once you determine that, understand that, that if there's hostility, you have to be ready to punch back twice as hard. You have to, and, and be preemptive in that attack. Which, by the way, you say that's a left idea. These are right? all left ideas. These to are, punch back twice as hard. Oh yeah, I mean, it was President Obama who coined the phrase, right? He was the one who was saying that, that his supporters ought to punch back twice as hard. And I've sort of hijacked that because I think that it's actually an effective tactic and, and necessary. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I've also said that one of the, that, that it's important at the very outset to ensure that the framing of questions is proper because one of the ways that the left it succeeds, and you see it in the Republican debates particularly, is they'll ask a question and then the Republicans won't even bother to try reframing what the question is. So mm -hmm. John Dickerson the other night in, in the CBS debate, he opens up with, and he tries to browbeat Ted Cruz on, you say that, that nobody should be confirmed in the last year of a, president's, of a president's run. Isn't it true that the Constitution says the president gets to pick the nominee? And Cruz, instead of just saying, 
you know, John, I don't care about the timeline. I don't know what you're talking about. We're not going to confirm anybody who doesn't agree to Scalia. Right? Instead of just saying that, and it's not our obligation to do that, the Constitution has many provisions, John. You know, <laughs> instead of just reframing the question, he, he sort of bought into it. And you, and you see that from, from a lot of these, from a lot of Republicans. They just accept the question as it comes to them, rather than thinking there's, there's a second question that's usually kind of imb embedded in the first question that's being asked in most in most debate. So right. th those are a couple examples. Th there's also you don't have to accept the uh, you don't have to accept the the kind of hero worship that, that uh, so many Republicans do. One of the frequent ones that you do is, is somebody will say, "Well, Ronald Reagan was for amnesty. Why do I care? Right. You know, I was I was two when you know when when he did amnesty. Mm -hmm. and what, what, like you want to talk about Reagan or when when people try to misdirect to Bush, you know they don't like oh, you're saying something about Obama, so they say something about Bush. So your proper answer should be. FDR, Woodrow Wilson, William Howard Taft, like, well, you want to talk about Bush, we'll talk about Bush. You want to talk sure. about Obama, we'll talk about Obama. Like, let's stick to the topic at hand. So a lot of, a lot of the, my basic rules for debate can basically be boiled down to, to two, which is get the character assassination off the table. Mm -hmm. If they're going to call you a racist, sexist, bigot, homophobe, the proper response is not, no, I'm not a racist, sexist, bigot, homophobe. Here's all the proof that I'm not. It's, no, you're a jackass because you have no proof of calling me that. And accusing people of things without evidence is the mark of being a jackass. Yeah. Right? And that's, that, that, that is the proper response. And then once that's all off the table, then we can actually have a policy argument. So what do you do about people that don't stop doing that? I, I had some... You leave. I mean, I, you just let it be because... You leave. But, I mean, you say this is not a worthwhile debate. You're an asshole and I'm leaving. Right. I mean, that's, there's, there's, no, there's no purpose to... to, to but sometimes don't you think that not picking up the fight, and this would be whether you're on the left or the right, whatever whatever fight you're in, that sometimes by not picking up the fight, you actually are strengthening them? No. I mean, because I think you're strengthening. Here, here's the logic, right? If somebody calls you a racist and you say, no, 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 let me explain to you why I'm not a racist. You, what you're really saying, what you're really saying is you're a rational fellow. Let's have a conversation <laughs> about why I'm not a racist. Yeah. By even granting the predicate, you're a rational fellow, he just called you a racist, right? If you say to me, I'm a racist, and then I say, well, you're a rational fellow. I'm saying to you, you're right, I'm a racist. You're a rational fellow calling me a racist. A rational person could theoretically think I'm a racist. Mm -hmm. No, the answer is that's an irrational thought. You're being irrational. What you're saying is, is ridiculous. And you're a bad person for, for dropping charges on me without evidence. Only bad people do this. Yeah. Right? If you're going to drop a charge, make sure you can back it up. Well, that's the thing. I find that there is an incredible lack of being able to back it up. And there's a constant, I don't know that you address this specifically, mm -hmm. but I find in a lot of these debates, when I have these debates with people, there's a constant moving of the goalposts. Yes. The, oh, so you say something and you sort of get the point across and they, they can, even if they don't outwardly accept that it, it is, mm -hmm. They intellectually do, and then they just move what they say, and then they just keep moving it, moving it, and then you're, you know, you're back in a circle. Right. I say, in the, I do say in that pamphlet that, that arguing with people on the left is sort of like trying to nail Jello to the wall. Like the minute, the minute that you, right. you finish one argument, they're already on to the next, and they're usually swiveling to places that they're more comfortable, like same-sex marriage or social issues, because that that those are those are issues closer to the heart, so they're they're more comfortable for them to argue. Uh, and so if you're arguing economics, invariably you find yourself talking about why Republicans are mean to gay people or something. It's 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 always a shifting goalpost because you can't get an if the, if the left. This is what I like about Sanders. I think Sanders will actually give honest answers to questions. If I say to Bernie Sanders, Bernie, what constitutes income equality? Forget income inequality. Like, mm -hmm. what gradation would it be? Income equality. Does everybody have to earn the same? Because there's a name for that, right? I mean, if everybody earns the same, the only way to do that is to confiscate all wealth and redistribute it. That's called communism, mm -hmm. right? I think that Sanders would, would actually answer that, but most people on the left won't. They'll just move the goalposts and Right. Know, what, and what do you think he would it. actually say? If, if I think that what he would probably say is he would say the sort of income inequality that we see in Europe is, is, is more beneficial to the, to the United States. And you say, well, okay, that requires a 60% tax rate. It means the, the car, literally the prices of your car will double because they have massive excise taxes over in, in Denmark. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, if, if that's something that you want to do, you're also going to have to you know, raise taxes on the poor, raise taxes on the middle class. You're going to have to gauge the fact that every business in America is going to leave, <laughs> which is not going to be pleasant for you. Are you willing to, are you willing to build? Here's the thing about Bernie Sanders' economic policy. Donald Trump wants to build a wall to keep people out. Bernie Sanders will have to build a wall to keep businesses in because they will leave. Right. I mean, he so, will actually have to chain them to a stake in order to keep them here. But I mean, speaking of businesses leaving and all that, did you see this piece this week about Alan Grayson from Florida? How he's he's been, but... I mean, he's been lobbying basically for companies that have money offshore in the Cayman Islands. Or 
where he's not lobbying yeah. as, a, as an elected official right now because mm -hmm. he's not elected right this second, but that he's been doing this for years. And this guy is a progressive hero. And he's right. doing the exact same stuff that Bernie would tell you is literally the worst thing you could do. And I pretty much agree with Bernie on that. Uh, mm -hmm. So it just shows you that their, their heroes aren't even lined up in any sort well, of... Well, that, that's true too, I think. Yeah. I think that's the case.